when we read the Bible, we are reading God's word. The Bible contains everything that God wants us to know. The Bible contains everything that we need to know. We don't need anything more or else. The Bible is what God says. So with that in mind, um, we'll read the first 13 verses of Romans in chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness of the law, um, which, the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God will bless that reading of his word and our, our consideration on it as well. Now, um, here we have, we've read a passage of the Bible, the Bible being the word of God, what God wants us to know. And we ask the question, as it is that we've read this passage, maybe there's a lot of it you maybe didn't understand or weren't quite familiar with what the passage was talking about. But from a very face value, even consideration of the text, even upon just reading that part of the Bible, we understand that this part of the Bible has a particular subject, a particular purpose, a particular topic in mind. We read in verse 1 that Paul was, was praying that certain people might be saved. We read at the very end of our passage, um, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We read at the end of verse 9, Thou shalt be saved. Time and again in this passage, what's being brought before us is what it means to be saved. How it is that a person gets saved. Um, we ask a question. If, if it is that this passage is all about being saved, that someone might be saved, thou shalt be saved, can be saved, if it is that this is all about being saved, and you might hear Christians talking about being saved, uh, a Christian is someone who has been saved, we must ask a question, when it is that this passage here, the man who wrote this passage called the Apostle Paul, when it is that Paul was writing these things and he talks about being saved, what's he talking about? What does this mean? What, what is it Christians are talking about and God is saying in the Bible when he talks about being saved? Well, we all understand that e even in the way that we use the word saved is that when it is that a person is saved, it presupposes that they need to be saved. It presupposes that they are in danger, that they are in a bad situation from which they must be saved. Salvation is required and salvation is necessary. Someone must be saved. Um, some of you might know that um, while I was a student, during my summers, I would go up to Peterhead uh, and I, would, I, would, I had family up in Peterhead. I would work in the fishing industry and just do manual labour for them in my summers and my spare time. Um, and in the church I was in at Peterhead, uh, there used to be a man called Alec McLean. Alec McLean. Um, some of you might remember Alec McLean. Um, now, Alec, Alec was a fisherman. He went to sea. That was his job. Uh, week after week, he'd go out to sea and, and catch how many ever, hundreds of tons of fish and bring it in. Um, but there was one day, Alec McLean was out at sea. He, he was out fishing. And uh, it happened that there was a storm while Alec was fishing. And uh, they were out on the deck. They were, they were doing their fish and they were, they were, um, the fish was coming in. They were processing the fish and sort of into sizes, whatever they do. And uh, they were in the middle of this storm and it was sort of touch and go whether or not they should keep fishing. Or whether it, is, whether it is that they should stop fishing and go in to the harbour. But they decided to keep going for a little bit longer. And as they were out on the deck, um, this big wave came. A, a wave that was sizably bigger than the rest of the waves. 
and uh, it came over the deck and there was boxes that went overboard, there was a lot of their gear that went overboard and Alec McLean had gone overboard as well and Alec was outside the boat, he was in the North Sea and what they say about the North Sea is that you've only really got a few minutes, two or three minutes and then you've had it, either you'll sink or you'll begin to freeze to death just because the North Sea is so cold and so boisterous. And here's Alec, and he's, he's gone overboard, he's in the North Sea, he's got two or three minutes, or he's going to die. He, his life's going to be lost at sea. And uh, the boat was slowly moving away from Alec, the boat was drifting away from him. Hope was going to be lost very soon. Um, but, but one man who had, who had stayed on the deck, one man who wasn't overboard, who was still on the boat, had a rope. Um, and because the boat was drifting away from Alec, this man understood, and Alec understood, that he really had one, one opportunity to throw this rope to Alec. And the man threw the rope, and by the grace of God, the rope landed just about right in Alec's hands. And Alec held on to the rope for dear life. And the man pulled Alec in, and Alec clambered onto the deck, and he was relieved, he was exhausted, but he was on the ship, and he was saved. He'd been saved from drowning in the North Sea. Now, we might well all say in that situation that that man, Alec McLean, he got saved. He was saved. And it's appropriate for, you, for us to use that word because Alec was in danger. There was a bad situation. He was at risk of freezing or sinking in the North Sea and he was saved from that danger. But what we understand from the Bible is that there's a need for us all to be saved. A need for us all to be saved. And what we all need to be saved from is something far worse than freezing to death or sinking in the North Sea. The Bible tells us that because we are sinners before God, we are on the road to a lost eternity. The Bible tells us that each one of us, in our natural condition, as we are having committed sins before God, that we are worthy of eternal punishment. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God has actually made himself readily known to everyone in the world. The Bible tells us, even in this book that we've read in Romans, in Romans in chapter 1, the Bible tells us that because of this very world, because there is a world at all by the world's creation, God has declared his eternal power and Godhead. It is clear that there is a God, it is clear that that God is powerful because there is a world at all. And every single person knows that. Every single person has this display of God's existence and God's power before them. The Bible tells us that God has given us a conscience, an inbuilt, at least, uh, at least uh, to an extent, a sense of right and wrong. The Bible in Romans 2 talks about the law written in their hearts. Not only that, but God's given us the Bible. Time and again, God has made himself known to man in the world, in our conscience, in the Bible. And what we understand is that on the grounds of these things, God holds us accountable for the way that we live. God will hold us accountable for the things that we have done in our life. Maybe you've never thought about that. Maybe up until now you've just considered yourself a, a, a free agent, not responsible to anyone. Well, what we understand is from the Bible is that there's someone who gave you your very existence. There's someone who made the world. There's someone who has, who has declared himself in the Bible. And that person is God. God has demands on you. You're accountable to God for the things that you've done in your life. And as I've mentioned already, what the Bible brings before us is that all have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen very far short of how we should have lived before God. All of us have committed sins. And you don't need me to, to tell you that. I'm sure we're all aware. I've committed sins. That is, there's things that I've done in my life that are wrong. I've thought wrong things. I've said wrong things. I've done wrong things. I've harboured hurtful attitudes toward people. I've been angry at things I shouldn't have been angry at. I've had hateful thoughts. And I've done things with my actions and with my words, things that I've said that are wrong, that offend God. And I'm sure if you're honest with your heart as well, you'll realise that you're, you've done the same. You've done things that are wrong. You've committed sins. And what the Bible tells us is that for those who have committed sins, God will judge those sins. God will judge people who have committed sins. You see, we would even expect this in our own courtrooms in, in Scotland or the UK or anywhere really. When it is that it's proven that someone's done something wrong? 
We expect that there be punishment for the thing that has been done. We would expect that any judge in any courtroom with a convicted criminal in front of them must judge the crime that's been committed. The Bible tells us that God is the same. In fact, God is, God is like that to a far greater extent. God is absolutely righteous. God is absolutely good. God's righteousness is inflexible. He does what is right 100% of the time. And because God is holy, because God is good uh, in an infinite level, more than any judge in any courtroom, because God is absolutely holy, absolutely good, God will see to it that sins are punished. God will see to it that sins are accounted for. And what we understand from the Bible very clearly is that if someone doesn't have their sins forgiven, they will be punished for the sins that they have committed. If it is that sins aren't forgiven, God will hold a person accountable and will punish a person, judge a person for sins committed. We actually read in the Bible about when this is going to happen. We read about a place called the Lake of Fire. We read about a place in Revelation 20, um, the second death. And we understand that anyone who is not saved... Anyone who doesn't have their sins forgiven will be punished in this place called the Lake of Fire. This is an awful place. It's a place that we even shudder to think about. And we don't talk about this place simply to, 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 because we enjoy it or to scare people. Although it would be a good thing if we feared before God. But we tell people this because unless we understand the situation that we are in before God, we'll never want to be saved. Unless we understand the fact that we've committed sins and that there is judgment to follow, we'll never want God's salvation. We'll never want what God offers in the gospel. The Bible talks about this real place, the lake of fire, where God judges sinners for committing sins. And it's an awful place. We read about people who are there in Revelation 20. It says they are tormented day and night forever and ever. The Lord Jesus spoke about a place where the worm dies not. We read in, in Jude's epistle about the blackness of darkness forever. This is an awful place. What the teaching of the Bible is that in and of ourselves, on account of what we have done, without a saviour, in and of ourselves, that's where we all deserve to go. If God hadn't been gracious to me, that's where I would have gone. That's where I deserve to go. And friend, can I tell you kindly, with a love for your soul, if it is that you're not saved, that's where you're heading. A lost eternity without Christ, without God, suffering in that forever. And so we understand then now, in this passage that we've read together in Romans 10, what it means for us for someone to be saved we understand what it means why is it that Paul here is talking about being saved why is it this is such a big thing that Christians talk about being saved is that because we're heading for judgment because we've committed sins and yet that it's possible for us to be saved that is the good news of the gospel by the way that's the reason that there is a meeting here at four o'clock every Sunday because it's possible for you to be saved from that judgment it's possible for you not to go there forever God has made a way by which you can know salvation. He can bless you despite what you deserve before him. And this passage tells us how it is that you can be saved from the judgment that you righteously deserve for your sins. I'm glad to tell you that I've been saved. I know that I will never go to the lake of fire. Not because I'm great. Not because I've done anything um, that impresses God. We'll understand exactly why it is in a second. But it's simply because God has been gracious toward me. And it can be the same for you. It can be the same for you even where you're sitting. So this, this passage tells us how it is that a person can be saved. We ask the question, how then is it? Well, something important to note, first of all, um, is that this passage brings before us a sure way that a person won't be saved. Uh, a sure way that a person will not be saved if they try it. Verses 2 and 3 brings that before us. It says, first of all, um, For I bear them record... That they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now, now what Paul's saying here is, he's just mentioned um, Israel in the previous verse. Now, Paul was a man who was from Israel. That was his country. The same way as I'm from Scotland, Paul was from Israel. And what, what, what the case was is, most people in Israel weren't saved. They hadn't believed in the Lord Jesus. They were, they were heading for a lost eternity. And Paul, Paul acknowledges that they're not saved. And it says of those people, people who aren't saved says that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So, so they have a zeal of God. That tells us that they're enthusiastic about things to do with God. They have a, a notion that, that things to do with God are important. They like these things. But Paul says these people still aren't saved. 
the, the enthusiasm and the zeal that they have for things to do with God, it's not in line with what the Bible says. It's not according to knowledge. And so what we're led to understand here is, it's possible for someone to be very enthusiastic about things to do with God or that bear the name of God and not be saved. Now, that's a solemn thing. That means that there are people who, who may attend um, church gatherings, who may come to gospel meetings like this, who might be very pleased with the fact that they come to meetings like this, who might do things in the name of God that are good works, but we understand they're not saved. Enthusiasm for things to do with God doesn't save people. We also see this in the next verse. He says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness. Here are people, and they're not saved. They're, they're on the road to a lost eternity. They haven't had their sins forgiven. And it says that they're trying to establish their own righteousness. That means they're going about trying to do things that are right. They're going about doing good works. Trying to earn favour with God. And what the Bible's telling us is that good works and trying to, trying to be righteous and to be good people is not how someone gets to heaven. It's not how someone knows salvation. It's not how someone gets saved. It's not by us trying to do really well and be good people. You see, the issue here is sins. The fact that we've done things that offend God. Now, no matter how many good works we do, no matter how perceivably righteous we might seem to other people, it doesn't take away the fact that we've committed sins and we're guilty before God if we're not saved. So we understand that simply having enthusiasm for things to do with God and trying to be good people is not how a person gets saved. There are many people who have died unsaved and many people who are in hell who have been upstanding citizens, who have been fairly religious people and they're not saved. But not only does this, not only does this passage tell us a sure way not to be saved gloriously and wonderfully, this passage tells us how we can be saved. This passage tells us exactly how it is that a person can escape judgment for their sins and can know God's salvation and can be on the road to heaven and not the road to hell. I want to point out first of all that the answer to how a person gets saved is centered on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. The text makes that very clear. Verse 4 talks about Christ as the end of the law. Verse 6 talks about to bring Christ down. Verse 7, to bring Christ up. Further down in verse 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Again verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's the Lord Jesus. This is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. The way for a person to be saved is firmly fixed and centred on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be saved. Without him we won't be saved. If it is that we are depending on anything or anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ, we won't be saved. It's all to do with the Lord Jesus that a person gets saved. Now I want to ask a question. Who is this man? Who's the Lord Jesus? The Bible makes it very clear who the Lord Jesus is. The Lord Jesus is the Son of God. There are verses in the Bible that make this abundantly clear. We read in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. In Hebrews in chapter 1, God the Father speaks to the Lord Jesus and he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God the Son, but he's God the Son who became a man. That same passage that I quoted in John 1 goes on to say, And the Word became flesh. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God, became a man. He took on flesh, he took on a body, and entered into time. I want to ask a question. Why is it the Lord Jesus Christ alone that can offer salvation? Why does it have to be him? Why is salvation from sins and from judgment all to do with the Lord Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us that it's all, it has to be the Lord Jesus because he is the only one who has paid the price for sins. He is the only one who has gone to Calvary. He is the only one who has made forgiveness of sins possible. You see, what happened was, at the end of the Lord Jesus' life on earth, he was crucified. I'm sure perhaps many of us are familiar with this. The Lord Jesus was crucified just outside Jerusalem around 2,000 years ago. And when it was that the Lord Jesus was on the cross, we learned this, that there were three hours while Christ hung on the cross. And for those three hours, 
the whole the whole earth was was dark. The land was black. God caused darkness to come upon the earth, and men couldn't see what was happening to the Lord Jesus for three hours as he hung on the cross. And what the Bible tells us is that in those three hours, in those three hours of darkness, when the Lord Jesus was on was on the cross at Calvary, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus suffered for sins. The Bible tells us the Lord Jesus suffered for sins. Now what's important to notice here is that the Lord Jesus didn't commit any sins. The Lord Jesus had never done anything wrong. He was the only man to ever live who had never committed a single sin. Remember we talked about the fact that we are sinners, that I've done things wrong and you've done things wrong. And because of that we're guilty before God. And that's why the Bible speaks about judgment. Well here's the the only man, the Lord Jesus, who never committed a single sin. Who never did anything wrong. The only man who wasn't worthy of judgment. And yet the Bible tells us is that in those three hours at Calvary, the Lord Jesus suffered for sins. That he was judged for sins that he hadn't committed. The only man who never committed any sins suffered for sins. This is the judgment that you and I deserve as those who have committed sins. The Lord Jesus who never did any sins suffered for sins. The Bible tells us this very clearly. In 1 Peter in in chapter 3 we read this. Christ hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. The Bible tells us that uh, in this very in this very book of the Bible, in chapter three, we read that the blood of Christ has propitiated God with respect to sins. That means that the demands of God against sins, because God is righteous and holy, the demands that He has for punishment against sins have been satisfied in full, met in full in what Christ suffered at Calvary. What we understand is one who never committed any sin suffered for sins says that he bore the sins of many in Hebrews chapter 9. Now, now, now this, is, this is so important. That means that in the blood of Christ, in the blood of Christ, there is provision for you to be forgiven of your sins. You see, God can't just forgive someone and sweep sins under the carpet. That wouldn't be in keeping with his holiness and with his righteousness. If God is going to forgive sins, those sins must still be punished. Those sins must still be the demands God has against those sins must still be met in full. And because Christ has suffered for sins, there's provision for you to be forgiven of your sins. Because there is someone who has suffered for sins, you don't need to suffer for your sins if you'll believe on him. The Bible makes this so, so clear. And this is why it must be Christ. He's the only person who can righteously offer you forgiveness of sins. He's the only person who has suffered for sins and 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 has provided for you to be forgiven of your sins. No one else has done that. No one else has done that. Only the Lord Jesus. And that's why it must be him on whom salvation centres. Now I've been saying that because Christ shed his blood at Calvary and in the blood of Christ, there's provision for sins to be forgiven. But we, we must ask the question, a really important point. If it's possible for me to be forgiven of my sins... If it's possible for me to be saved, how do I come into the good of it? How does that go from being a potential thing to being an actual thing? If it is that God has made it possible for me to be saved and forgiven, how do I actually come into the good of salvation? How do I know my sins forgiven? Because the Bible makes it clear. Just because it's possible for you to be forgiven of your sins doesn't mean that we're all automatically forgiven of our sins. The Bible tells us that only some will be forgiven of their sins. How do I come into the good of what God has made possible? The Bible tells us, this passage tells us very clearly how this is the case. Verse 8 says, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. So here we have, the way that a person knows their sins forgiven is through faith. The word of faith which we preach. What we understand is this is simple dependence and trust. This is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that it's connected with the Lord Jesus in the next verse. It centers on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is faith in a person. Faith in the Lord Jesus. The sure, the sure promise of God's word is that if someone has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be saved. They'll be forgiven of their sins. Now, 
when we talk about faith in the Lord Jesus and believing in the Lord Jesus, this is a trust, a dependence on him alone for salvation. And if someone depends on Christ for salvation, they'll be saved. The verse goes on to tell us some other things. He says in verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that is, when a person gets saved, they are acknowledging that the Lord Jesus is Lord. They are confessing Christ as Lord. That is, we come to Christ in faith, acknowledging who he is, acknowledging that he is Lord, that he's the Son of God, that God has made him Christ and Lord, that he's Lord of all, that he's my Lord. We understand that Christ is Lord. When a person is saved, they are willing to confess that Christ is Lord, Lord of all. Now, not only so, but verse 9 goes on to say, that thou believe in, thine, uh, believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. We believe that God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. Now this is so important because the fact that God has raised the Lord Jesus from the dead is the evidence and the proof that Calvary brought satisfaction to the heart of God. The fact that God raised Christ from the dead proves that Calvary was enough and more than enough for the salvation of your soul and for the forgiveness of your sins. And so when it is that a person gets saved, this verse tells so clearly how a person gets saved. We come to Christ in faith and in dependence on him. We acknowledge that he is Lord of all, acknowledging that he has risen from the dead and is in heaven. And so we trust in a living Christ, one who is raised from the dead, and we depend on him alone for salvation. Now it's important to note in verse 10 that he goes on to say, With the heart man believes unto righteousness. This is something that someone does with the heart. It's with the heart that someone believes. So what this is telling us is that when we believe in the Lord Jesus, it's not just believing things about the Lord Jesus. This isn't just believing that he is the Son of God. This isn't just believing that he died. This isn't just believing that he suffered for sins. This isn't just believing that he is risen and in heaven. But this is a trust, a dependence on him. This is me entrusting my soul to him. This is me saying, where I go forever is no longer down to me. I'm trusting him with that matter. I am entrusting myself, my eternal soul, my spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a dependence and a trust in a living person, the Lord Jesus now it's so important to notice that this isn't to do with works. This, is, this isn't something that we earn before God. This isn't going to a certain place or doing a certain thing. This isn't living in a certain way and saying you believe certain things. This is simply trusting the Lord Jesus. It could happen where you're sitting right now. This is simply trusting the Lord Jesus. Believing in him for salvation. And the promise of God is this. Is that if someone does that. If anyone believes in the Lord Jesus they'll be saved. That's how this passage actually finishes. It says in verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's telling us that if anyone, if anyone will call on Christ for salvation, will depend on him, confessing him as Lord, whosoever, anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of God is they'll be saved. Now, we need to ask the question then, have you been saved? Is that something that you have done? What are you depending on for salvation? Are you trusting your own righteousness, your own efforts? Or have you believed in the Lord Jesus? Are you simply trusting him? It's so important. There's no more important matter in life than, to, than for this to be the case, to trust Christ. This world is taken up with so many things. And there's so many things that the devil would love to blind you with to get this matter away from your head. It, it doesn't matter what car you drive. It doesn't matter how many bedrooms are in your house. Your salary is irrelevant. It doesn't matter who wins the Premier League. It doesn't matter what's going on in social media. It doesn't matter what's going on in world affairs. What matters is that you get saved. What matters is that you're right for eternity. What matters is that you have your sins forgiven. God loves you and he wants to save you. And the Bible tells us that if it is that we don't get saved, we will be in a lost eternity forever. We will be caused to suffer. We will be under the judgment of God forever if we don't get saved. 
For someone without Christ there is only judgment after death. But if it is that a person does get saved, if it is that you simply trust Christ, God will forgive you of your sins. You will never see judgment if you believe in the Lord Jesus. In fact, forever, for eternity, forever, you'll be with God and with Christ in heaven. You'll know joy without end, bliss without alloy, a place where the Bible calls the new heaven and the new earth. That is the eternal, forever home of those who have believed in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in that place there's no death, there's no suffering, there's no crying, there's no pain. A place where God dwells with men. A place where there is blessing and joy forever. And the Bible says God has procured that for you. And if you will have it, if any man believes on his son, he'll give it freely. And he's wanting to give it to you. And if you trust his son, acknowledging that you're a sinner, acknowledging that you need him and that Christ is your only hope, God will save you. God will save you. And I trust if you haven't done that already, you will do so for the glory of God.